chance to um, continue our journey with the Apostle Paul, Barnabas, and others and their crew as they march across uh, you know, the land where they're at and bringing the gospel and the good news. And it's been, they just got started. And uh, it's already been amazingly fruitful and hopefully really inspiring, also challenging in some way, shape, or form. Like, it, it, it's pretty awesome. It's pretty amazing. So let me pray before we jump in because I just want to ask the Lord for help. And Heavenly Father, I just pray that, you know, as we read this, as we read about, you know, your faithful sons and daughters in, you know, early church, there's, I'm just blown away, Lord God, by how much they didn't have. They just, they just didn't have so much, Lord, that we, in our day and age, think is incredibly essential. And, um, Heavenly Father, I just pray that you give us a clearer vision and better perspective as far as what's really essential and what's really important. And I pray, Holy Spirit, you just speak to our hearts in a powerful way about what really matters in this life. The actual real important things, the things that are weighty. Help us to be able to get better at differentiating the majors from the minors. And I just pray, God, that uh, in our place, Lord, where we're at right here in Naugatuck, in our homes, surrounding towns, Holy Spirit, we're asking uh, to have lives and experiences that continue to resemble more like what we read about in the early church. And uh, it's not in our hearts, Lord, to like relive it and just become something that has already been done. Lord, you know you want to do something fresh here and now. And we realize it's not even possible without the leading and guiding and filling of you, Holy Spirit. So we just ask for a fresh outpouring we ask for a fresh guiding. I pray that you just build in our town and around our midst continued stories and situations that look something like what we read about here in the book of Acts, Lord. Continue to take us on this journey that goes beyond uh, knowledge, that goes beyond education, that goes beyond all the other things that sometimes we think really matter. So we love you, Lord. We thank you that it's possible with you. And we thank you that you wouldn't put it in our hearts unless you didn't plan to do something about it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Acts 14. Let's take a look here. You know, we left off in 13, uh, chapter 13 there in uh, quite a wild situation we had develop. And as we close up in 13, it says this. It says, verse 49, The word of the Lord spread through the whole region, but the Jews incited the God-fearing women of high standing and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. So they shook the dust off from their feet in protest and against them and went to Iconium and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. So we leave them off being super powerful, super effective. And even though they just got kicked out of a particular region because... I don't even know if it's a large percentage, but a certain percentage of the population was like, man, we don't want you here. We don't want you talking about that. Um, they still left filled with joy, filled with excitement, because for them, it wasn't about them being liked. It wasn't that they were trying to create a name for themselves. It wasn't like they were trying to get people to agree with their message. It was very much about, hey, God has called us to give this message. We are on mission, and some will receive and some won't. That's not going to at all factor into my self-esteem and how I feel about myself. We are on mission. Everybody say, on mission. On mission. On mission. That's one of the things that I love uh, that I hunger for, that when I read and I look at, it inspires me, it causes me to just want to celebrate with them and be like, you know what, I want my life, and hopefully you want your life, to somehow really reflect how legitimately on mission you are. How legitimately on mission I am. Much less about how religious am I. Much less about how well do I perfectly perform. Right? But much more about 
what is God looking to speak and do through my life? Tell other people about Jesus. Okay, yes, that's, that's a good starting point right there. But how does he want to do that? How does he want to reveal what he's like and what his nature is like? Well, guess what? The short answer to that, there's a longer answer, but the short answer is he wants to do it in infinitely variety, different ways through all kinds of people at different times. And for me, personally, that's kind of exciting because that means I am not called to be the next Paul. I'm not called to be the next Barnabas. I'm not called to be the next whoever. God has specific plans, callings, and purposes on my life for Jared to speak through Jared, for Loretta to speak through Loretta, right? For Kyle to speak through Kyle. And it's supposed to be that way. And so automatically that makes us all involved. And hopefully that fills you with a certain sense. It might fill you with a sense of fear and anxiety, being like, oh wait. But hopefully you get more of a feeling of, wow, this is like can be a legit adventure for me too. Like we're reading about these guys and this early church and what they did is definitely an adventure. There's something exciting about a journey and an adventure and going on it. And we're all on it together. We're all on it together. And um, the fact that they were so focused on the mission at hand just speaks volumes. Because I think that's something that's like actually pretty rare nowadays. To be really focused on the mission, on the mission, on the mission. So let's take a look. Acts 14 says this. It says that Iconium, Paul and Barnabas, uh, went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. So right away, like that is kind of intriguing to me because Iconium, that's like 80 miles south of where they just were. That's a long way to be walking. What's the longest you've ever walked? Now, what's the longest you've ever walked in a really bad pair of sandals? What's the longest you've ever walked in a really bad pair of sandals in a really hot sun? Eight miles is far. So they just head down there. They see that as the next available opportunity. And they're like, well, didn't... You know, nobody's in their midst. It's like, oh, it's so far. You know, can't God send somebody else over there? And, and what's interesting to me is that on that 80 miles, I don't know about you, but typically when I know that there's a trip coming up or I'm going somewhere, number one, I'm not typically walking real far. Number two, I'm getting in my car. Number three, I'm thinking about, well, since it's going to be a long car ride, what kind of music am I going to listen to? Is there a podcast I might check out? Like, how am I going to fill my time? I think there's something to be said for a certain situation like theirs where they got 80 miles to go, they only have themselves, and there's nothing really of entertainment value there at all. In other words, they just, they can't be distracted by anything else. They know they're about to go 80 miles. I don't think it's like far-fetched to think they're going to spend some time praying, spend some time talking, spend some time laughing. Just enjoying relationship. And then when they get there, we're going to see in a little bit, there's this phrase in there that Paul says he looked at a man. And it says Paul could tell by looking at him that he had the faith to be healed. You should make that face when you read that. <laughs> what? what? What do you mean he saw the faith to be healed? Like, did he see an angel on the guy? Did What did he see? And the Bible doesn't say anything. Kind of grateful for that. Because then if the Bible did say, we'd be looking for that one thing all the time. And then that would be like our green light. Maybe he saw something. Maybe he didn't. Maybe, let, it, let me just suggest to you another thing to think about. Maybe they were so used to living in an environment where distractions were at a bare minimum, that their ability to be sensitive to God's spirit and his voice was heightened in a really powerful way. And for me, that's like super challenging, very convicting. And you know what? I've also found for there to be a lot of truth there. Because when I am able to successfully settle down for whatever margin of time, and just take my time and be quiet and be silent and just recognize it's just, this is just a place for the Lord right now for just His Spirit. 
there's a certain type of sensitivity and a unique you know, touch and intimacy that just happens in that place. And so, sure, there's a lot of benefits of living in 2019, but certainly one of the great challenges of our day is just distractions. And we can just justify as many like, distractions as we want, but there's a lot of distractions. It's tough. So when I read that and I see 80 miles, hanging out just with their crew, just talking, just focus on the mission at hand, I'm like, wow, you know, like there's, there's something to that. There's something to that. So there they go, 80 miles, far away and uncomfortable. It wasn't a reason for them to stop. When they got there, look what happened. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. Holy Spirit, help us to speak so effectively that people will want to respond and say yes. Amen? Please add that to your prayer list some way, somehow. Where you actually ask the Holy Spirit to anoint your speech, to put something on your language, so that way when you talk and represent, represent Jesus Christ to the world around you, there's something more than just theological points. There's something more substantial. That's unusual to just be talking and then people just responding and saying yes. There's this God that died for me and there's forgiveness of sins in Jesus and now I give my life completely over to Him and say no to my immediate fleshly desires and say yes to things I don't even know about? Sure! <laughs> it's unusual for people to say yes to that. So Holy Spirit, please bless, touch, and anoint what we say and how we say it. It's a big deal. There are some things, listen, you could study for for months and gain knowledge and have it be secure in your heart and just have that be a part of you and just feel like you're really confident in the situation and talk about it. There are also some situations where if you're on your face before the Lord, not knowing how to handle a situation and bringing your heart before Him, he will speak and minister some simple truth to your heart. And you'll, that's all you'll have to carry into a conversation with someone else. And more times than not, you'll experience so much more fruit in that simple word from the Lord from your quiet time than hours of sermons or studies or whatever you do over there. And I'm not saying there's no value to those. Obviously, there's value to those. But there's, what I am saying is there's nothing like personal, first-hand information, knowledge, intimacy from the Lord. Like what you're hearing right now, this is second-hand information. The Spirit's going to speak with you and stir you on and things like while you're here and certain things will just attach and you'll carry throughout the week. And, but you're hearing it through me. Nothing like first-hand when you get it directly from the source. And the good news is available all the time, everywhere, no matter the situation. That's amazing. So they go there. They spoke so effectively that a great number believed. Verse 2. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. Spiritual warfare, right? Verse 3. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there speaking boldly for the Lord. Wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Verse 2. The Jews who refused to believe stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. In other versions, right in the Greek, if you read it more closely, they were there and they are pretty malicious and they were actually violent. Like they were physically harassing them and trying to assault them. Now hold on. In verse 3, the very next verse... What is their, how are they going to handle this situation of actual threat, actual physical opposition? Well, they thought it was good in verse 3. Let's spend some more time here. What is that about? Aren't the signs pointing to this is dangerous, you should get out of here, flee for your safety? 
a good point. But, I guess Paul, Barnabas, and crew were so focused on mission, they recognized an opportunity in the midst of the opposition. In other words, even though it was so difficult, and things were getting sideways based on faulty information from hostile people, that wasn't in their mind justification to be like, okay, our time here is done. It was, you know what, we should dig in our heels a little bit harder. One of the things that I've really struggled with personally in life, and maybe you have as well, maybe you haven't, but, you know, there's just seasons, so there's things in your life, there's seasons in your life where you want things to be different. You want a different job, you want a different relationship. You just want to see things go differently. And then, if you're like a lot of people, you just pray that God would just fix and just change those things. And then maybe sometimes you get even more bold and you're like, in Jesus' name, change that thing right now. You know, and you just go through these different things. You just, you just want to see it change. I want it to change. And, you know, when, I, when we read and as we read and as we look at these guys and as they're moving in this early church, I no doubt, I, I totally think they wanted that to change too. They don't want these people there. I mean, obviously in the last chapter, like Paul just went up to the guy and said, hey, you're from the devil. You know, everything you're saying is wrong. You just need to be, you're done. I'm sure they didn't want those problems. And the reality is, God doesn't always just fix or just change them immediately right away. He actually let them be there on purpose. He let them be there on purpose. Because he knows that if we are able to successfully cling to Him and bring our faith to Him, that He's going to show us how faithful He can be in the middle of that situation. We're going to get to see like what He's really like. And it's only going to come out of intimacy. So things might not immediately change, but we're going to start to understand and have a better awareness of the power that we possess within the situation. Like, for them, they weren't looking to get out of this situation. They said, you know what, like, we got to stay here. we got to help them out. Because as soon as we leave, these guys are going to come in and just basically destroy all the work and all the groundwork that we just laid down. And I don't even know if it was full consensus among their group. I'd have to imagine, if they're like normal people, like you and I, there might have been one or two in the group, like, nah, we should be out of here. Like, what are you talking about? It's not safe. And so what are you going to do in those situations? Will you use logic? Because the logic people are right in that situation, by the way. It's not safe. But does that mean it's time to stop? See, those are things we've got to think about. And we're going to find in a minute, at least at this current situation, it was not time to stop. Even though it wasn't super safe. It's about to get more unsafe. And then they'll have to stop. But I think sometimes we're, we're like, I don't know, we're just, we're, we're just soft serve ice cream sometimes. We're just kind of softies. And so when stuff gets a little difficult and a little hard and we have tough people in tough situations, it's just we just lose it. And I'm going through stuff. You know, I'm going through it. We're all, listen, we're always going through things. Always. It never ends. And someone's like, well, that's really depressing. No. <laughs> it's only depressing without Jesus. Like you're missing the whole deal. It's only depressing without Jesus and the Holy Spirit. As soon as He's involved in the situation, now it's breeding ground for the supernatural. Now it's breeding ground for the kingdom of God to come and be made manifest. We all got challenges and situations we are not loving right now. Maybe God will get rid of them right away. But there's a great chance he might not. And I, there's a greater desire for him to be brought into those situations instead of him just getting rid of the situations. Saying, hey, listen, I put you in the middle of that. Bring my kingdom. It's within you. I don't know how to do that, God. Okay, let me show you. Let me teach you. Let me give you the words to say. 
I love the fact that they didn't leave. And then watch what they're going to do after this. This is wild. So it says, verse 3, it says, So they spent considerable time there, speaking boldly for the Lord, who confirmed the message of His grace by enabling them to do miraculous signs and wonders. Let me suggest something to you here. There's something to be said for patiently persevering in an environment, in a situation that connects supernatural activity. I just want you to think about that. There's something to be said for when you could leave and when it does seem dangerous and it is super uncomfortable and it is really difficult, when it is a hard job and is it a hard person and it is a difficult season of life, it's, it's very tempting to try and numb that out, escape it as much as possible, try and not be around it. I get that. That's what our flesh wants to do. Who of us loves to be in really st stressful, squeezing situations? None of us. But if we can find a way to patiently persevere and cling on to the person and promises of Jesus Christ, if we make that choice, and a lot, listen, it's not like a one-time deal. It's like something we typically have to do over and over again for a particular season. If we choose to do that, we see time and time again that His supernatural presence, and come in a variety of ways, but His supernatural presence is not far behind that. In other words, like God really honors people that are not looking to escape out of difficulty, but that are trying to bring whatever He wants into the middle of that. And I'm not saying we should walk around being masochists and just saying, I want everything bad. I'm not saying that. Beat yourself all the time because you deserve it and you're a bad person. It's like this craziness. I mean, what I'm saying. What I am saying is like God has unique and special opportunities for all of us, usually posing as problems or difficulties. And where we should really invest and wear ourselves out is, Father, how can I bring your kingdom into this situation? Another thing you want to add to your prayer list. Father, how do I bring your kingdom here in this environment? I see these people for seven or eight hours. We don't get deep conversation. How do I bring your kingdom here? Father, I'm here all day at home with the kids. How do I bring your kingdom here? Father, I'm about to go to this like difficult family party or family event. I don't want to just like seclude people. I don't want to cut off possibly you working. How do I bring your kingdom here? I'm in this season of my life or in this marriage. I want your kingdom to be the main mark and not my complaining. How do I do it, Lord? Put people around my life that will help make this happen. Not so it gets fixed, but so you get glory. Right? It's a complete mind shift. And only the Holy Spirit does that. Verse 4, the people of the city were divided. Everybody say, that's no surprise. Anytime you got heavy Jesus, you got heavy division. That's just what he does. He's a polarizing savior and man of God. He just brings division. He's, whenever he says, anyone says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, like truth isn't a set of ideas or philosophy, it's a person. And when they say, I am the way, the truth, and the life, not everybody's a fan. It's dividing. It's dividing. And that's why it's so critically important to be on mission and not like uh, on self-affirmation. If somebody was caught up in how people like them and how the message will be received, then they're going to tie their self-worth and their value based upon how somebody receives what they're going to tell them. So if you're going to go get, tell somebody the gospel about Jesus Christ and you feel like you're going to lose a friend in the middle of that, you're probably not going to do it if you are not really clear on what the mission is and who you are as a son and daughter. You don't ever want that to hijack what God wants to do in your life. Well, I'm not, I don't know if I'm going to share that because then I'm going to lose some friends. Well, I don't know if I'm going to share that because then they're going to think this way about me. But then if I really share the truth of what I believe, it's going to change the relationships around me. So I don't want to rock the boat there. No, don't, no. Be a son or daughter that's on mission. Father, you got something that you're trying to speak and bring through my life. 
Help me not get caught up in this. I may have been caught up in it before. I may have like fell before. But it doesn't mean I have to this time. And I want to do it different. So then verse 5. There was a plot afoot among the Gentiles and Jews together with their leaders to mistreat them and stone them. Everybody say next level. This just got serious. So it went from physical like threats and intimidation to, hey, we're going to stone you now. The level changed. It was dangerous before. It just got real now. It says, but they found out about it and they fled. So look at this. Isn't this interesting? So I hope you're paying attention. It was dangerous before. They found it necessary to stay. Then it really got increased. Like, all right, now it's just, it's too hot now. Now we got to go. Bless you. Bless you. <laughs> so it's necessary, right, to see it as there's different levels. So do people just get out of dangerous situations when they come up? Obviously not every time. There's godly wisdom and timing involved in each. Well, how do you know if it's from God? I'm glad that you asked that. That's the key piece to all this. So then they leave. They go to Lystra and Derby, verse 7, where they continue to preach the good news. So it didn't stop them from talking about it. They just changed location. Now check this out. In Lystra, I won't, I won't spend as long as this one. On Lystra, there sat a man crippled in his feet who was lame from birth and had never walked. So, this is the third time, if you're taking notes and you're a Bible student, have been following. This is the third time we're reading in the book of Acts how someone who couldn't walk previously, there's going to be a miracle, spoiler alert, where they're going to be able to walk. The previous two examples, they could walk for a period of time and then they couldn't. This is the first one where somebody was crippled from birth and then they're going to be able to walk. This is a true creative miracle. They never walked before, never had that experience, never shared in it. So there's a man crippled in his feet, lame from birth, and he had never walked. Verse 9, he listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed, and called out, stand up on your feet. And at that, the man jumped up and began to walk. This is what I'm saying. Like, what did he see? And maybe he did see something in the spiritual realm. People see things. That's not uncommon in the kingdom of God where people have an ability to see into the spiritual realm. It happens among God's people. If you'd like to see it, ask him for it. You should. At the same time, that's pretty bold to say, hey man, just get up and do it. If you spend any time reading, like about past, you know, evangelists and, and, and services and what people used to do, you know, there's, I forget his name, but there's this one guy who used to have hold services and he'd have people, uh, when they would come in, if they had wheelchairs or they had crutches, he'd make them, he'd break them before they came in, he'd break the crutch or break the wheelchair, and then he'd have his service and allegedly, I say allegedly because I wasn't there and I don't know, but the accounts are that they would come out walking. That's just, that's amazing. It's amazing. I personally don't carry that faith currently right now. <laughs> that doesn't mean I might not ever. I'm totally open to that. Totally open to that. Today, I don't, I'm not carrying it. But maybe the Holy Spirit would drop something on me in a moment where I could. And I believe in that. And I'm open to that. And hopefully you are too. Because he's not just looking trying to use pastors. He's using sons and daughters. That's how the kingdom gets built. And then the sad thing is, some people see stuff like that or they hear about that. Then they try and create copycat environments. So they're like, oh, so-and-so did that. So guess what? At our service now, when people have a wheelchair, they have crutches, we're going to start crushing them and doing the same thing and praying the same way and hopefully we get the same results, right? Because it's a formula. Everybody say no. 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 There's a level of faith and anointing and an awareness of his presence of what he's doing in the moment. And we're all at different places on that. 
But I promise you that God is looking to bring us to be places where we're hypersensitive to where He's at, to where the Spirit is ministering, and we flow right into that. I want to do that as often as possible. And I hope that's in your heart, that you want to do that as often as possible. So he sees this, tells him to get up and walk. And listen, if you spent any time in the medical field, like, this is a ridiculous miracle. He's never walked. He doesn't have the bones for it. Like, they're not, they haven't formed the muscles. You need physical therapy. Like, how do you do that? How do you train your body to now all of a sudden just act that way? The whole rest of your body is used to being the way that it's always been. And then now it's, he's just going to get walking around? This is crazy. I'm so glad they threatened to stone him. I bet this man was too. God, thank you. They're, they're going to try and stone him because otherwise he would have never came here and healed me. It's crazy to think about. Verse 11 when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. Everybody, hopefully here, knows God does the miracles. He uses His people. He's got the power. He's got the ability. If we choose to partner, He uses us in that way. So then, they think Paul and Barnabas are the ones that are doing this, even though it's the God behind them. Verse 12, Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. <laughs> so they start naming them. Because it's such a ridiculous miracle. They got to be gods, right? Verse 13, the priest of Zeus, so the temp, there was a temple right there, whose temple was set just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. Things just got real sideways real fast. <laughs> God just did an amazing move and now the whole people are turned out and be like, yeah, Zeus and Hermes, they did it. And now the priests at that temple is also confirming that fact and like, hey, bring the bulls, bring the goats, they're going to sacrifice to these guys. Verse 14, when the apostles... Barnabas and Paul, which by the way, on a totally side note, since when did Barnabas become an apostle? I'll leave that with you. Okay, but when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of this, they tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd, shouting, men, why are you doing this? We too are only men, human like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God, who made heaven and earth and see in everything in them. And in the past, he let all nations go their own way, yet he has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food, fills your hearts with joy. In other words, like he's a good, kind God. He looks out for you. He provides for you. And even in this moment now, he's showing what, his light, what he's like. You ever ask yourself, like, what's even the purpose of a sign and wonder? Especially when we're such an entertainment crazy society and we love seeing that stuff. We just get caught up in it. Do you ever ask yourself and think about like, God, why would you even do that? You see the potential for harm. Like, why? And if you don't have a working answer on that yet, let me just add to maybe part of your answer that you're working out with him. Part of it definitely has to do with God is love. And he's aware intimately, as Mark or someone prayed before during worship, he's intimately aware of each and every person forever, for all time. Literally banked up heaven with Jesus Christ. And he loves those that are made in his image. And he wants to make sure that people receive that and feel that. In words and in deed and in supernatural activity. He wants to. He wants to. There's this devil, there's this enemy who's set on making sure people don't receive that. Or if they get close to it, he'll try and do whatever he can to distort it. But he wants to do that. That's what Paul's trying to make this case. He's like, I'm just a man. I'm just surrendered to, to the God that's alive. That's it. So they, they don't know what to do with that. It says, verse 18, even with these words, they had difficulty 
keeping the crowds from sacrificing to them. They don't know. They just saw the miraculous thing and they're, they're stuck there. Just stuck on the show. Verse 19, Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. It happened again. You know those like, I don't know what they're called. Those little fish, you know, they're like always near the sharks, little scavengers that are always like... These are your guys, right? They're just going around, man, just looking for scratch, just creating problems and issues. And they're just these little tag-alongs. So they followed him down there, won the crowd over. Look at this. They stoned Paul. The thing he was just running from, by the way. They found him. This is like 50 miles away, something like that. They found him. They still stoned him. Dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. So a lot of Bible scholars think he actually was dead. And a lot of Bible scholars also believe, which I think I share the same opinion, in 1 Corinthians 12, we don't have time for it today, but it talks about, Paul says, you know, um, there once was a man, you know, who was caught up to the third heaven. And he gives like a description as far as his revelation of what he saw when he was either dead or quasi-dead or whatever state he was in. A lot of people suggest this is that situation, this is that circumstance. Is when he was stoned and he was dead, not dead, you know, they could tell. I mean, I've been hit with rocks from my kids. I've never been stoned from adults, you know, like to, I can't even. So they stoned him, dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up, and you gotta imagine, they probably just weren't like looking at him. You know, they're praying in Jesus' name. Crying out, God, the work's not done yet. This can't be it. Like, you warned us. We left that environment. They found us here. Like, we just saw this happen. It's not over. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city. The next day, he and Barnabas left for Derby. It says they preached the good news in that city and won a large number of disciples. So they went back to the place where he just got stoned. And then check this out. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. Then he also went back to the other place that they were running from when they heard the threat of the stoning. Do you, I hope you're seeing the commitment to the mission. God has a work. God has a plan. I know there's threats of all kinds of craziness. I'm not stopping as far as what God has called me to. Fixing their focus on the mission and doing what God has called them to do. Verse 22. I got this underlined. Maybe you might want to. Because this gives us a little bit of an inside look as far as the heart behind this mission-focused people. Verse 22, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. In their heart of hearts, they weren't just trying to get converts. Don't hear that. Please don't hear that. They weren't just trying to get converts. They weren't just trying to get people to say a prayer. They weren't just trying to pe get people to be a member of a church. They weren't just trying to get people to give money to their missionary trip that they're doing. They truly cared for the individual that, yes, they would say yes to Jesus, but then also from there they wanted to strengthen them so it would make it easier for them to continue to say yes to Jesus in their walk with Him. That's where their heart was. That's where they came alive. But yeah, it's like their work wasn't done if they got them to believe and receive the message. To them, that just started it. When a lot of times, like in our culture, it's like, okay, how many people filled out a prayer card? How many people, like, raised their hand? How many people, like, we measure weird things. And I say weird because you don't see it. It's not like that in the New Testament. It was about the health and the transformational, deep transformational change for individual lives. That's how you measure people. Guess what? It doesn't fit real good on a form. <laughs> you can't fill out a form for that. You can't take a survey. It happens in one-on-one -on -one relationship. One-on-one. -on -one, walking through life with people. Praying with people. Another term for that is discipleship. And that's why the title of the message is Supernatural Discipleship. This is supernatural in that, listen, 
if most stuff is dangerous, people will leave. They certainly won't return back to it. You have the stoning happen, call it all off. The type of heart that was behind these guys and what God had done inside of them and what they brought to the world around them, supernatural. It was much more than, hey, I'm going to bring you some Bible verses, I'm going to give you some quotes, and uh, maybe I'll give you some articles, and then, you know, God bless you. It was, no, like, I want to walk this through with you, so hopefully you reach a point of maturity, so now you can do that with other people. That was the goal. That was the goal. Verse 21, we're almost done here. They preached the good news in that city, and they won a large number of disciples. Thank God they went back. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. Shh, oh, sorry, that was verse 22. Uh, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church, and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord, in whom they had put their trust. And after going through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia, right? They went to all these places. Uh, verse 27. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles and they stayed there a long time with the disciples. That's an awesome trip out. That's their first trip. And they went out. And I, hopefully when you read that, you see a heavy focus on nurturing and cultivating interpersonal relationships with people so that they can be strong in the faith. I hope that you see that. And it goes much further than trying to join a group, trying to get your money, trying to do anything. It was about, guys, here's how you strengthen yourself in the Lord. Here's how you become obedient to Jesus Christ and what He taught. Here's how you can get strength from the Holy Spirit to help you carry it on. This is what it's about. And a sermon doesn't get you there. Some singing doesn't get you there. It comes with the Spirit of God, like guiding, leading, filling, and equipping people. And so a key term there is discipleship. Discipleship. And as you saw in that video up there, right, the women are going to start up some discipleship training stuff uh, in October, right, that first Saturday there. The men, we just had ours. It's, this is going to continue. The series is pretty good, but it's pretty long. So we'll do it, split it up into sections. But it's all with an intentional focus of we don't want our church to grow and we don't want certain things to happen in our church unless... We're pretty healthy trying to also understand that we are, yes, sons and daughters, but we're also called like to make disciples. That's, that's, the, that's the mission. It's to grow in relationship with the Lord, encourage deep transformational change, and partner with His Spirit, and from there we're, we're supposed to be making disciples. Well, how do you do that? Am I supposed to make converts? Yeah, to some sense of the word, Yes. Does that mean you'll always be sitting down with someone, praying a prayer as they give their lives to Jesus Christ? No. But we should definitely be growing in that. And so skilled and so sensitive with the Holy Spirit that's like, okay, Holy Spirit, what are you working on here? Like, how can I bring your truth and your kingdom like somehow into the situation? How can I bring it into this conversation? Jesus said, go make disciples. He didn't say, I'm going to go make them. He didn't say, I'm going to send some angels to make them. He said, sons and daughters, go expand the kingdom. Go tell and go show what I'm like. And it's tough to do that if we actually don't do that in our own lives. Very difficult, pretty much impossible, because then you just make this thing all religious. And then we'll think that we just have to do a whole bunch of things. And then somehow we're being a good disciple and things get messed up. So one of the things you'll start to hear more about with, like in our church, as like the year goes on and as different things happen, we want to be a little more intentional about making disciples, not in a religious way, but in a spirit, hopefully spirit-filled, spirit-led, spirit-guided way. We have an acronym um, that we talked about before. It hasn't been a lot, but we'll talk about it more. C-A-L-D. Called. And the idea behind that is, let's say someone came to, came to, uh, comes to church next week, first time. Oh, wow, okay, you know, it means to people. In some way, shape, or form, there should be sort of, at least among the leaders, deacons and elders, there should at least be amongst them in their mindset, let me show you the, the one we don't want to have. The mindset we don't want to have is, how can we get them to become a member? 
how can we get their money? How can we get them into something? So that way we have some stats we can give to somebody else. That is not the way you want to look at it. Unfortunately, it's very prevalent, very common. And it gets disguised as other stuff. But there should at least be a game plan of, hey, how can we help this individual in the relationship with Christ to bring them closer to Christ? So C-A-L-D called helps with that. First idea, so the idea is someone comes, they don't know anybody, hey listen, there's no pressure right away. The focus will just be, just try and get them just to connect. Did they talk with somebody in their pew? Beyond, hey, how are you? Is there some kind of connection happening in some way, shape, or form with someone? That's super healthy. No pressure, just go ahead and do that. If it seems like, and that's a big if, if it seems like there's a connection, because the reality is, this is just not a home church for everybody. And it's totally fine. I mean, I don't know how somebody could want to, but no. I, <laughs> just kidding. That's you probably shouldn't have said that. But it's totally fine. Because it's not a good fit for everyone. But if it is, then say, hey, listen, like, do you actually want to like be, you know, kind of move from just a tender to sort of member, like part of a fruitful family? And then like address that stuff. So the A would be attached. So now they go from connecting to actually attaching and be part of the family. And then from there, the L is for learning. They got to like learn, like who is Jesus? Like what's he calling? Who's the Holy Spirit? How's he looking to guide them? Like where's he trying to take them? That's why we have small groups. Now we have other opportunities to learn. And then the D would be for deploy. Like send them out. Give them opportunities to try different things. So now put into practice things they've been learning. And so that's just like a very general, just small snapshot as far as what a possible roadmap at CC Nagi could look like. And so within that is discipleship. You can't really deploy people to try and do different things with new knowledge. You want to deploy and let people go and release them if there's actually life change real significant life change where they actually love Jesus and they want to tell everybody else about it. And so a big part of that is discipleship. Because you can just smack a position and a title on someone, it doesn't mean anything. But who are the people that really love God? Who are the people that like, are really just to serve, not even have a title? They would, they would be the same with or without it. So one of the aspects of discipleship that I hope that we really grow in within the next year or so, the next couple of years, I hope we never stop growing in, but really start to take more intentional steps towards, is this part of discipleship, for me, it boils down to this. It boils down to, who am I discipling, and who's discipling me? I think every Christian believer should have someone who's in front of them and have someone who's behind them. That's healthy discipleship. Notice, I said nothing about small groups, which you should go to them. But I'm saying the core of discipleship, to have it really done well at transformational levels, it's got to be interpersonal with at least one other person. Where someone a little bit in front of you in the face, somebody a little further along in their journey, like, you know what? I need to just soak stuff up with them. I need to process just things with them. I, just need, I need to be in communication with them because it's just good for me. I have someone like that in my life. Well, a couple other people, but one that I can really count on. And that's the other thing you're going to find out. Some you can count on for that, some you can't. But then you also should have people behind you, not in an inferior kind of way, but just season of life kind of way. So it's like, you know what? Who can I invest into? Because I'm just not supposed to receive who can I invest into? Who am I, like, discipling? That's really healthy if a Christian believer can, can have those two people in their lives. That's discipleship done really well. And so it's something that I want you to think about, start praying about, um, because that's how we want to make impact and grow here in this town. We want to be able to do it not because, like, you know, we have cool whatever. We want to do it because, listen, our church is growing because we're actually making disciples. Not because we could entertain people. But how do we do that unless we're actually making disciples? Like, unless I'm trying to, I'm checking up on Jared. Like, is Jared doing what he can to be a faithful disciple? That's something we got to ask ourselves, you know, and be super intentional about. 
Because it's much more than just telling people more information. And the fruit of that looks like what we see here. It looks like a heart that starts to develop and really, truly cares for people and the relationship with the Lord. It goes beyond treating them like a project. It goes beyond trying to have some other angle with them. It's like, no, I want to make sure like, you're grown in the Lord and you get to experience what He's really like. So, hopefully you guys can think about some of that stuff. I hope you find great encouragement, right? As far as Paul and Barnabas and what these guys are doing, how they're going after the gospel, how they're mission-focused. And please start thinking about, hey, who's in front of me? Who's behind me? Who would I entrust myself to? That's somebody further along? Who would I... Who would I be able to actually truly help? Maybe that's somebody a little bit behind me. And be cognizant of that and actually praying about it. Because God will definitely speak to you on that. But I will ask you this. As you start to consider one in front, one in front, one in behind, it just won't always work out well with your first, sometimes second, sometimes third choices of going around it. Uh, please be gracious. It's kind of frustrating too, especially like when you try, like, I can remember in my own life and trying to ask people just to, hey, so, like, it's kind of a big deal for me. Uh, but I, I just, I see where you're at. I think you could, if you're up for it, you know, would you ever just be available to me so that way you could, like, speak into my life and, like, I'll listen, you know, and just, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, that sounds great. And then, like, six months, it's like, what the heck? Like, I've been trying, you know, and it doesn't, and so that can jade you a little bit. Try not to fall into that. Try to be gracious. Don't like just turn and just start gossiping about someone or saying bad things or whatever. It just didn't work with that person. Just leave it like that. No blame attached. It just didn't work. Amen? Amen.